All right. Welcome to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Principles of Pastured Pork. I'm Jesse Schmidt, and I work with the UVM Extension New Farmer Project and the Women's Ag Network. I'll be moderating this evening. Our presenter this evening is Bruce Hennessy. Bruce and his wife, uh, Beth Whiting, started Maple Wind Farm in Huntington, Vermont in 1998. They use a management-intensive grazing system to build the ecological health and diversity of their soils. They raise many species of animals on their farm, including beef, lamb, poultry, and of course, pork. In his pre previous work, Bruce, Bruce was a K-12 teacher. We're, we are lucky to have him um, here bringing his educator skills to us this evening. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry about the PowerPoint presentation. I'm not sure why it's not there. I actually spent a little bit of time on it, so I'm disappointed that I can't share it with you. But We'll do the best we can. I'm going to be kind of flipping back and forth with my own slides to make sure I stay on track. Um, but before we get started, let me ask everyone, is there anyone out there, just put a green check by your name, if you are currently or have in the past uh, pastured pork before? I see maybe one or two people. Okay, so a lot of folks that are just getting started, maybe three. Um, it's good to know that we have some, some folks in there. I'd love to hear some of your experiences if uh, if you want to pass them along to the group as well through the chat and I can I, we can uh, field questions and, and go forward that way. So uh, <clears throat> we, um, we run a diversified farm in Huntington, Vermont that's where we produce 100% pasture, 100% uh, grass-fed beef and lamb, and pasture-raised pork and poultry. Um, we also do organic vegetables and maple syrup. And a big part of our program here is obviously pasture-raised pork. So um, everybody on our farm has a job, uh, from our cows who are our long grass grazers to our sheep, who are kind of the short grass and forbs grazers to our, uh, all of our poultry groups, our layers, and our broilers, and our, uh, and our turkeys that uh, cleanse and, and fertilize the pasture. And, uh, and we use our pigs as renovators and, uh, excuse me, and uh, compost converters, and also um, <clears throat> to to uh, to do some machine free tillage on our ground to get it ready for for vegetable production or to <clears throat> to uh, reseed it to to high end pasture and so that's their job on the farm and in exchange we get a tremendous uh, a product that we can sell to our to our neighbors and friends and and uh, customers here uh, close by um, and so. <clears throat> um, I think the question raises right here. What you know? Why why raise pigs on pasture? Why do we do it? And there's a number number of reasons, and I'll spell them out for you. And you can you can certainly uh, ask questions or or take these further. Things are fairly basic here for those of you who haven't done this before. Um, <clears throat> so I will. Uh, I'd certainly t uh, answer questions that are that go into more depth as needed. All right. So the nature of pigs. What are they? When pigs are omnivores, they can, um, as they grow and especially as they get a little bit bigger, you know, 30, 40, 50 pounds, they can glean up to 70% of what they need to thrive from plants and animals above and below the soil surface. Um, and allowing pigs to kind of express their natural tendency to root and get below the ground surface and look for all different kinds of foods um, <clears throat> makes for a very stress-free life. And uh, we think that the result of that um, is, uh, is a much better quality pro uh, product once we take our pork to, to our customers. So, um, so in allowing pigs to be pigs, is a big part of why we have them out on pasture. And it's really their nature to be out there uh, uh, moving forward. So um, I just got to check back and forth between things here as we 
Look, if there again, if there's any questions, I hope you'll speak up, uh, Jessica, and let me know um, if there's something something to answer there, because I'm <laughs> I'm I'm in my PowerPoint product, uh, presentation right now. Yeah, I'll I'll uh, be monitoring the chat box for you. Fantastic, thank you. All right, so <clears throat> everybody has a job, and um, pigs are really a primary part of what we do on the farm in terms of being a part of the farm ecosystem. They do renovate pasture. We have a lot of, of ground that um, uh, that we <clears throat> that we took over about 13 years ago when we started the farm that was almost back to forest. It was old pasture. Um, we did a little bit of brush hogging, but decided that that wasn't the best way to tackle this problem. So we started grazing with their various animal groups and in places where we had some really tough brush and uh, and uh, in weed pressure we put pigs in there and they were they they loved being there and also turned the ground and then we would go through and and uh, seed with a with a perennial polyculture of of different grasses and legumes and and forbs and and uh and their ability to do this on rough and tumble ground where we didn't even want to drive a tractor was a was a big part of of our pasture port program um they can also do this in tillable ground and actually make nice seed beds for your vegetables um we use them also to take compost from our kitchens and from our farm waste and turn that uh turn that into the soil and also into great pork um and we feel like turning Turning uh, the soil over, particularly in our forests, can can make for better seed to soil contact um, and a healthier forest ecosystem as well. So uh, that's our that's our focus and why and, and why we pasture pigs instead of just putting them on concrete or bedding and and, and uh, putting the grain to them. So uh, pigs do very well on on grass. Out in the out in the meadow, and they also do very well in the forest. Um, uh, both places offer lots for them to eat and explore and put their noses into um, insects under the ground, grubs and plants. They certainly eat grass and and legumes. Uh, they'll eat leaves and bark, um, and and look for mushrooms and things like that in the forest floor. But I think and our experience has been that they they do best when they have access to both. So our ideal uh, 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 pork pasture is one that uh, is is right on the edge where there's the most diversity of life, um, right on the edge of the forest going into the meadow, and we try our best to do that. We have lots of overgrown hedgerows on our property, and that's. Uh, we, we tend to um, put our pigs into those hedgerows and let them root around in there, but also have quite a bit of open pasture to work with, and uh, we get the best result from that. Oops, I'm sorry. So. All right, so uh, a lot of people ask us when they're talking about pigs on pasture, um, you know, how do you know when to move pigs off a certain piece of ground and put them onto another piece of ground? And, and we, <clears throat> we've developed a number of ways of thinking about this over the last uh, 12 years. Um, first, the first thing you want to decide is what is your goal for that certain piece of ground? Are you really trying to renovate and change the species in that area, or are you just trying to give the pigs a, 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 a great food source and keep that food source in place as a viable plant uh, going forward? So um, you can move them very quickly. When we start, uh, when we start our piglets after they're uh, weaned on pasture, we we move them right behind our sheep. And they move every uh, one to three days behind our sheep, right? Uh, using the same netting that the sheep do. Um, so they move very quickly. 
they happen to love uh, sheep manure and cow manure. There's a lot to eat in there, along with the insects and and larvae and things that that uh, exist in those those um, those droppings. And uh, we find that that w works out very well, especially with those young animals that are not going to rip up our high, higher end pastures with uh, big, strong noses. Um, if we're intending to renovate, and we're really looking at um, changing the, the plant species in a certain area, we will uh, leave larger pigs in that area for much longer. Um, but being careful not to over impact that area and lose our soil structure. And I think you tend to do that, you tend to see that when um, the piles that uh, that are made by turning over the soil um, start to to break down and uh, and and get flatter and uh, harder and dustier. So there's a lot of compaction there. And for us, um, we're we're long gone way before that happens. Um, we also look at the manure distribution in the paddock. And when when there's a decent amount of distribution, in other words, you're having a hard time getting across the paddock um, without stepping in, in, in piles everywhere. Uh, you know, before that happens, we, we also move our animals off that time. But there is a general rule that we use, and that is that, um, it is, and this is especially true when we're renovating, not so much for a simple graze where we're just going right behind our sheep or cows, but when we're renovating, we generally have uh, oh, sets of between 25 and 40 animals on about a quarter acre paddock. Um, and we move those animals after about a, uh, a consumption of about a ton of feed, a ton of supplemental feed. Now, we'll talk a lot more about feed later on in the, in the webinar, but, uh, you know, you can imagine that if there's a ton of feed for smaller animals that are maybe 20 to 30 pounds, 25 to 40 of them, they're going to be on that ground much longer than, let's say, animals that are 150 to 200 pounds. Um, uh, in the same number. So if you have 40, 200 pounders, they're going to go through a ton of feed in about three to four days. And uh, if you have 40, 30 pounders or 50 pounders, it's more like two weeks. And that's kind of how we regulate uh, the impact on each piece of ground there. Um, Bruce, there have been a, um, some questions about, and if you're going to get to this later in your presentation, uh, we can defer it. But um, you mentioned briefly fencing, and there are questions about what kind of fencing you're using, um, and how that, uh, and how you're actually moving the pigs efficiently. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I do have a, a large section on that, but okay. The, well, let's let's wait till then. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can't see these great pictures of all of our fences. Um, so actually, the very next slide in my PowerPoint talks about, you know, to move pigs. What do you do to move them efficiently? And, uh, you know, it, it obviously it depends on whether you need to move them across the farm or even to a, uh, you know, to the, to the processor or, or just next door into the very next paddock. Um, we try to <laughs> set them up so they're contiguous to their next paddock during during the year, uh, during the season, so that we don't have to move them long distances. Occasionally we do, and we have different methods for that. But um, for us, we take out any supplemental feed at least 24 hours before moving them. And uh, not that they don't still have things in that pasture to eat, and of course they have plenty of fresh water. Um, but when they're when they're missing kind of the 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 uh, the candy, so to speak, the, the the additional supplemental feed for 24 hours, they tend to become very very curious. And uh, if you pull out some of that into the next paddock, they'll move readily, especially uh, you know once you've taken the fence out of the way. Um, so uh, that's what we do. As a matter of fact. Uh, we just loaded some pigs for market the other day, and 
we took out their feed for 24 hours. Uh, they they were still having a great time rooting around, but when we pulled up with the trailer, they all walked right on, going after the the apples and uh, and compost that we put up in there. Um, so th so that's how we move them. Um, we also, uh, you know, if we have large moves like that, we'll leave a trailer in their paddock. So we'll we'll make a gateway that that uh, that is filled by the by the trailer itself and put the feed in the trailer. And uh, you know, if you have the ability to do that for a couple of days, you'll find that your pigs are spending a lot of time in there eventually. And all you need to do is go out early in the morning and close the door, and there you have them. But uh, in general, that's what we do. We take out supplemental feed, and within a day, they're ready to move on to the next to the next piece. Um, uh, in terms of fencing, that is, you guys anticipated where I was going next. So we have um, basically three different ways. We have perimeter fence that is high tensile hard wire fence, very very hot. Um, and for most pig sets, um, we have the ability to get that fence down to six inches off the ground and 14 inches off the ground, a minimum of two of two strands. Um, for subdividing those, uh, you know, the <coughs> from the perimeter, that's the source of our electricity. We don't really use solar chargers because we've We've learned that they don't work very well with pigs. They just don't have a hard enough um, charge. Uh, we use polywire, which is available at pretty much any farm store. Um, and it's very flexible, easy to roll up, and easy to put out. And again, we, we do two strands at 6 and 14 inches, approximately. Um, and those will do for longer, more renovation style uh, setups. When we're when we're moving the pigs fairly quickly, um, we will uh, use flexi net, the same kind of net that you would use for your sheep. Uh, Premier uh, fencing, which is the the company that we use, is now makes a pig uh, a pig net, which doesn't have a, a, a strand that goes all the way to the ground. Um, because one of the disadvantages to using flexing net is that pigs will often root soil up onto the bottom strands of the flexing net, and then it's caught. Now, if your if you know if your daily chore is to turn off your electricity and go up and check your pig fence and just pull it up out of the out of the rootings, um, it still works very well, and and you end up uh, with a very good barrier. Um, the neat thing about FlexiNet is that it's very portable. Um, you can set it up in just a few minutes, and uh, it makes it more likely that you're going to move your your pigs as fast as you'd like to. And I think that's I think that's important. It's the reason that we use FlexNet when we're in a situation where we want to move pigs forward as, as quickly as we can, or you know, on a, on a regular basis. Um, and uh, this new product from Premier actually has made that even easier um, because you, you never get the net caught underneath uh, a bunch of, of sod. Um, the, the most important part about fencing for pigs is to train them on the various kinds of fence you're going to have in a space that they can't break out of. So we have a training we have a training area that's in one of our barns, and we set up poly wire, some hard wire, and flexi net in there, uh, just uh, just across one corner. We make it very hot, um, uh, 10,000 volts on a pulse through those through that um, fence, and uh, we might even put something that smells uh, interesting on the other side, just to get them to to test it or to try it. And within uh, uh, 48 hours, those pigs know exactly what that fence means, and uh, you know they might have even gone through it or, you know, uh, pushed it down um, uh, after they've gotten shocked a few times, but haven't gotten out obviously because they're in a building. 
and uh, we found that 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 pretty much guarantees that we're not going to have any breakouts when we get get them out onto pasture. Now, uh, piglets that are born on uh, the that are born on pasture find out from their moms and from their own experience uh, about fences long before they're going to go charging through any nets and that's uh, or nets or and or polywire. So um, we found that we've never had to really train piglets, um, but only you know new pigs that may come onto the farm or pigs that were born in the winter. Um, uh, that haven't experienced electric uh, fencing yet. So very important to train them before they go out. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of screaming and and uh, and a lot of down fence. All right, moving on from there. Were there other questions, Jess? Um, one question came up was um, about determining paddock size, um, and are you doing a how, how are you determining paddock size? Well, um, we do not determine paddock size based on the amount of grass that's in there. So for us, you know, again, it's a, it's all about our goal uh, for that particular area. If we if we're looking to renovate ground that we need to reseed and, and change the basically change the uh, species in that in that soil. Um, we find that a quarter acre matched to about between 25 and 40 animals works very well. Um, and, and, and for the time it takes them to go through a, a ton of supplemental feed, whatever you decide that's going to be, um, we found that 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 in in general, and of course you have to be you have to use your observation skills and really look at the soil and see if you're starting to break down the soil structure deep below the surface then you need to move them obviously but uh if you're if you if you're just getting things turned over and and uh the, you know it's enough impact to really move uh and till the soil and then moving them in about a ton of feet and that's that's about what we're looking for so it's it's um so when we're renovating, we're doing about a quarter acre, um, which would be, you know, maybe three nets, uh, three hundred and sixty-five foot nets spread out. Um, when we're on pasture, and we're our intent is to give them fresh grass and droppings behind a, another animal group. Um, and because of labor, we also marry them up to another. Uh, we marry a pig set up to another animal group, like sheep, um, so that we're only setting nets once for two different animal groups. Um, then uh, we're we don't really care about impact on the ground, and therefore they can move through that. Uh, very, very quickly, and we depend on the animal that's leading them to set the pace. Um, and in those paddocks are generally uh, two thirds of an acre to to an, to up to an acre. Uh, every uh, depending on the size of the sheep, or, uh, you know, size of the sheep group, anywhere from one to three days. So that's that's how we're um, that's how we're determining paddock size. We're, you know, and, and very often we'll have uh, our vegetable sites or other areas where we just, you know, we're going to uh, march through in quarter acre paddocks um, to, to try to really impact that area so that we can uh, seed it or plant it to something different. Um, Great. We, all right. So let me see. We've already been through kind of the fencing options. Let's talk about watering for a second. Um, uh, because we're in a diversified grazing program, we try to have water to every paddock. Um, we run a number of miles of, of black plastic pipe on the surface. So during the grazing season, we have water going out to all our paddocks. And what we're trying to trying to accomplish there is to 
um, reduce animals having to be laned back to any any kind of more permanent water source. We want the water to go with them, and uh, pigs are no different. Um, so we we utilize that. We try to have water in every paddock. Uh, <clears throat> in some cases, and especially now when things uh, get very cold at night and all our surface water uh, pro, uh, systems are shut down, we we might have to haul water out to them. Um, but uh, during during the grazing season, we we run off these uh, surface lines, and we're generally running to nipples. And what we found is there there are a couple of different systems. Um, one is a tank system that runs on a float that has a uh, small drinking cups at the bottom. We've had problems with those um, in that some of our larger animals have a hard time getting their head into them. So they work well for younger animals, but not not great for larger animals, particularly our breeding sets. And uh, so we've we've used nipples. They're very easy. They're very easy to move. Um, if you're in a short-term situation, they don't make a huge mess. So uh, in longer-term situations, they will tend to wallow underneath those nipples. Um, so these are nipple waterers. They can be found again at any any farm uh, supply store or online. Um, we run a hose right to it, and we we uh, clamp it with hose clamps. Uh, clamp the nipple with hose clamps to to a post that we drive into the ground and. Uh, um, and they uh, they do very well with that. It's an unlimited supply of fresh water. Uh, so <clears throat> very important, obviously, for pigs. Um, so moving on from there, unless there's questions. Bruce, one question came up is if you ever have trouble with the pigs not wanting to drink warm water, um, if if the water gets too hot in those black right. hoses? Um, well, most of our black hoses are under grass for the most part. We don't have a big hot water problem in super hot weather. And of course, <clears throat> we do live in Vermont, so we have, uh, and we live, uh, you know, at above 1,500 feet uh, here in the Green Mountains. So we're cooler than most places. So it might, it could be an issue somewhere else. Um, so in that case, maybe you know maybe those tank waters would be a, a better idea. Um, there's also open open face water uh, in water um, watering tanks. Uh, they tend to get very dirty. We do use them when things start to freeze around here, um, and we have to clean them out every day, or maybe if not every day, every two days. Um, the the big thing about those waters is that they need to be Heavy and they need to be low enough for the pigs to get into them, and they but they need to be heavy enough that they don't just knock them over with the first uh, with the first push of their nose, which which they do with with most waters, uh, open tank waters. Um, so we're using them now, and uh, they're they're fairly big but low, and when they're full, they're hard to knock over, and that's that's what we're looking for there. Uh, Geez, I don't know what I would do other than you certainly could, instead of running black pipe, you could run a different color pipe. They do make clear pipe. Um, I know that from sugaring. Uh, they, they make clear and blue piping so that uh, temperatures don't get too high within the pipe. But since most of our pipes are laid on the ground, the grass grows right over them, uh, we found that they, they stay relatively uh, relatively cool. Any follow up on that? I think that's it. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> in addition to to you know kind of fencing and water systems, your your pigs, especially in hotter areas, are, they're going to need um, they're they're going to need some shade in the summer, some type of of shelter in the summer, and of course in the winter and for farrowing, they're going to need uh, they're going to need shelter as well. Um, so for us, you know, when we're in our border areas or our borderlands or in our hedgerows, the the shade of, of just trees overhead is plenty for them in the summer and, and rain doesn't really bother them even if it's a 
cool, you know, even if it's in the 40s or something like that, it's not a big deal as long as they do have um, some shelter from the wind and, and, and some shade for those hot summer days. Um, that's very important. They, they, they really do need that. They don't, they don't sweat per se, which is why they need to, to wallow to keep cool. Um, but if they have shade, that's a good substitute for that, even if they don't have a wallow. Um, it might be as simple for us, we do a lot of this, um, when they're in the open, you know, if we have pigs in the open field, we'll just drive a, drive a flatbed wagon out there and move it into each paddock. And uh, that, that gives them plenty of shade to just crawl right underneath there in the, hot, in the heat of the day and get out of it. Um, in the winter, it's a, it's, it's a different story. You really do need to have a roof over their head uh, um, for those nights especially. And, and we do outwinter pigs uh, quite often. The secret to outwintering pigs is is having a, a, a simple shelter that keeps uh, that keeps the wind and and the precipitation off of them. Uh, you know, for the most part, it doesn't have to be sealed up, but uh, it can have an open end, which is how we do. We kind of have a Quonset hut arrangements that have open ends, um, and then providing a lot of bedding in those shelters. So we'll put several round bales into those shelters and round bales of hay and uh, roll them out and they have deep, you know, they have a two, three feet of, of good deep dry bedding. And if they have dry, uh, deep dry bedding, um, no matter how cold it gets, and it certainly gets very cold up at our place below zero at times, they will do very, very well. Um, uh, and of course, I think for, for farrowing out on pasture, you need to have some type of shelter. Um, we have run the gamut from uh, just providing a sow a large round bale that's unwrapped and being able to burrow up in there with her <coughs> with her uh, her litter, um, and actually even be able to stay out of the rain more or less in that area to uh, to farrowing huts that are again just smaller versions of that Quonset hut, and making sure that there's good deep dry bedding in those in those uh in those shelters for farrowing. All right. Just getting to my next slide here. So let's talk about supplemental feed for for a few minutes, we are um, <clears throat> we're of course in the business of trying of of allowing pigs to get or tr trying to get pigs to get as much out of the pasture and the forest floor as they possibly can. Um, but we have not been able to uh, eliminate supplemental feed, and and even though that kind of in the back of my mind is always a goal, you know how much. How little supplemental feed can we provide and still have a, a thriving uh, herd, herd of uh, pigs? Um, but uh, so that being said, um, we certainly provide uh, quite a bit of supplemental feed, and and it does help them thrive and grow within a reasonable amount of time and get them out uh, 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 to our customers. Um, and there are many options in that respect. So I'll go through those, and, and if you have any questions, uh, you know, let me know. Oh, I lost my slide on that one. Okay, so so we feed a mix here on the farm. Um, we feed a mix of kitchen and farm compost, uh, any vegetables that are non-saleable that don't it, that are maybe you know have a nick on them or a little rotten on one side or whatever. Uh, we uh, we have a family cow and we can't come close to even you know coming we can't come close to finishing all the milk that she produces. Um, <clears throat> any extra raw milk goes into her into the into the pig diet, and when we make cheese, the whey goes in there too. Um, we have a local bakery. Uh, that ends up with some day-old breads and 
and and other items that we that we feed as well. Um, so uh, lots of different lots of different things. Um, in the past, we've also uh, um, grown vegetable crops specifically for our pigs, uh, <coughs> and you know, uh, so we've grown an extra 30% of most of our squashes, winter squash, pumpkins, um, zucchini, uh, uh, even carrots. We've been able to uh, put out there, and, and the pigs, the pigs love to have that um, as a as a diversified part of their diet. A lot of times, they'll mix our milk in with the grain, and and put it out that way. Um, and there's really kind of two ways that we feed animals. There are times and in certain situations where we will um, feed piecemeal, like I'm talking about, and much of the time we do that where we have this mix. And then there are times, particularly in the winter when we're starting to run out of vegetables, that we will um, go free choice, especially when it's very, very cold, and we'll use range feeders. Uh, that that have about a, a ton uh, feeding capacity. That's also to kind of save on labor. We lose uh, we lose our interns uh, about now, and it starts to get very hard to feed out all these pigs um, uh, uh, by hand rather than having a feeder in the in the paddock with them. Um, plus, they need a little bit more feed to to stay warm. Uh, so. So those are our options now. In terms of what we're feeding for grain, um, we're feeding a 14% uh, pig grain that we can pick up. We are looking into right now uh, grinding our own grain, which we haven't quite figured out yet. But we're we, we're looking into getting a mixer grinder and doing that. And the the main reason for that is that. Um, is that we'd like to feed a totally non-GMO feed to our pigs, which is nearly impossible unless you're 100% organic uh, in this market. So <clears throat> right now you can get uh, you can get other feeds that are not uh, that haven't g gotten taken over by the GMO market right now, um, uh, particular particularly barley and oats. And I think uh, I think you can make a fine ration with barley and oats that that does well for pigs. Um, the one thing is that you should know about pigs is they they will not overeat. They might get somewhat fat, but they don't overeat like humans can tend to, especially at Thanksgiving this time of year. So uh, uh, you really don't have to worry about it. But one of the things that we do to encourage grazing. And to to get pigs to diversify their diet is to feed just about just 90% of what we think the pigs really need um, on a daily basis, and, and encouraging them with by uh, spreading feed over the ground into certain areas. We encourage them to root and graze. So if there's a particular area that we want the pigs to hit hard, we'll we'll spread feed on right onto that and. Uh, of course, after there's a you know after there's a, that area becomes full of manure, we wouldn't ever do that. But we certainly would do it if it hasn't been touched by the pigs yet. Um, one of the things that we have learned is that <clears throat> you want to try your best not to allow those pigs to associate you with their feed. Now, there's a lot of strategies for that. One is you could just go free choice. Um, the other is, uh, you know, you can um, you can distract them with something else, uh, some other type of novelty. They love to play with things, uh, balls, frisbees. They're just very interested in anything that you have uh, that you have to show them. Um, while somebody else quickly dumps in the feed in a different area, um, but uh, once they associate you with feed. Uh, there can there can be situations that aren't comfortable for people getting bowled over or knocked over or, or you know pushed down into the muck is never any fun so we so we we strive pretty hard not to 
not to let them connect us with the food in any way, but connect us with other more uh, fun things. So uh, do your best to do that. Hard thing to to accomplish, but um, worth thinking about anyway. You know, with our sows, I'll get in there and get them get down and scratch their bellies and give them a good. Uh, Good, some good, a good love session while while somebody else comes in and and puts their mix into the, in, in into their feeders and and um, that that seems to work really well for us. All right, so um, let's just see where we're at here. Supplemental feed. So consider this. So Bruce, before you move on from feed. Um, some, there were some questions about the the ratio of grain to scraps, um, and how do you know how much grain to feed out um, based on the amount of pasture and scraps they're consuming? Uh, it's there is a science to it, but mostly we are <laughs> more artistic about it ourselves. It's a general feeling. We'll go pound for pound compost for uh, for grain. So, if we have compost or vegetables or uh, milk, we'll you know at a at a certain amount of pounds, we'll take out the, that many pounds of grain in our in our feeding uh, regimen that for that particular day or week or whatever we have. Um, right now, uh, we have a chart. That as they grow, they get so many so many pounds per per day. You know, it starts out at uh, less than a pound. Of course, for weaned piglets, they're only 15 or 20 pounds. You know, and it moves up through to where our you know our <clears throat> our big mama sows, our big 600 pound sows, are are getting you know seven eight pounds a day just to maintain uh, where they're at. So. Um, uh, that's you know, and you also have to take into account that there's going to be some waste, some some loss into the ground that they can't really get. Uh, even if you're feeding into you know into feeders, um, there's going to be some loss. So you want to make sure um, that you take that into account. So our, for instance, our sows that are getting seven eight that should get seven eight pounds a day are probably getting closer to ten total pounds of grain, and then uh, losing a couple pounds of that. Um, so the other way to decide is to is to you know th these pigs should be you know they should be gaining in about a three to one ratio. So um, for every three pounds of feed you put into them, they they should be getting about a pound of gain out of that uh, out of that feed. And so you should be watching them grow. They should look like they should look uh, big and muscular, even as piglets. They should look like they're filling out. They should have some extra chunk on them and, and some weight if they're skinny. Uh, if you can see bone, um, if their hand, if they're you know if the if their thighs don't look like ham hocks, they they're 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 not growing the way they should. And there could be a number of reasons for that. You might be giving them plenty of feed and they might have parasite issues or or other things going on. But in general, um, we're looking at their condition. And their condition should be uh, they, they should be filling out quickly and uh, robustly uh, without um, <clears throat> without having too much feed there. Uh, they they won't overeat. So if you're worried about that, at least initially, you know a, 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 a free choice situation is not a terrible thing, and they will continue to to graze and root and things like that. Um, because because they're naturally curious, they're omnivorous. They'll eat just about anything you put out there for them. Um, if you offer them something new, even if they have free choice, they will uh, they, they they will go after it and see what that's all about. So um, it's it's a good I think it's a good uh, I, I think it's good to just train your eye. Go look at other people's pigs. Uh, Make sure that you make just make sure your pigs are growing and thriving the way they should be. Um, and if they if they aren't, and you're convinced that they are getting enough feed, then you need to look for other 
uh, other possible issues, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Um, <clears throat> so just just to consider these things as you go forward, and these are things that we're uh, uh, con that we're currently working on, and and that we've done or will do go going forward. You know, uh, grow some extra vegetables for just for you for with the idea of feeding them to your pigs. It really is worth it. It turns um, <clears throat> it turns vegetables into fantastic protein, and and uh, if you can grow it in such a way that you can have them come in and hog it down right where it sits, rather than having to harvest it, all the better. Save a lot of energy that way, um, and we've certainly done we've done that with with sweet corn, or we've done it with uh, with with squash, and um, we've planted squash directly into some of our our compost piles, and then allowed the pigs to turn those over after they'd grown in, and it was a, just a tremendous boon for them and, and easy for us. Uh, tap your local artisanal cheese maker for a supply of high protein whey. If you have anybody by you that's making cheese, they have a lot of whey that's sitting there. Unless they're feeding it to their own pigs, um, they're generally either dumping it or, um, uh, you know, or they're finding other livestock producers to give it to. Usually, it's free. Um, the hard part is, of course, uh, you know, getting getting it in any quantity to you. Uh, so if you can figure that out, there are people doing it up our way, and we're we're trying to figure out how to do that on a on a larger scale rather than just what we do here on the farm. And I think that's worth doing. It's very high protein, and if you uh, if you add some supplements, uh, small amounts of other grains that have more starches and sugars, then you'll have a nice balanced diet. Um, and again, I, I did talk about this before, but grinding your own feed to to get a non-GMO source of from barley and oats. Barley can substitute right in for corn, and oats have high protein. And I think you can uh, make a, a real good feed out of that. And we're we're actively working towards the day when we do that. All right. If we're, no one has a question, we'll. Uh, Move on to um, breeds, breeds on pasture. <clears throat> We've had pretty much the whole gamut of breeds here at Maple Wind Farm. We've uh, we've had your 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 standard, uh, you know, pink pigs, um, uh, and they've done very well on pasture. Uh, but there are a number of breeds that um, that uh, are known for better pasture utilization and are able to thrive and 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 do better on with pasture and less uh, and, and less grain. Um, and among them are Old Spots, Tamworths, and Berkshires. We have we've decided to go the route of of a cross, and so we have uh, Tamworth. Sows and uh, and a uh, and and a Berkshire boar. Uh, Tamworths, uh, great pasture utilization. They're less likely to tear up your pastures, um, though they're certainly uh, able to do so and will do so, especially if you have uh, well mineralized soils. Um, they do very well on forage and. Uh, and their feed conversion is is great. So, where you're expecting a three to one ratio um, with many pigs, you can often get better than that, two and a half to one or two pounds to one. Uh, with the with the best handlers that I've heard of, can can uh, sometimes get two to one grain to uh, grain pounds to to pounds gained um, ratio, which is a tremendously good good. Uh, Good deal. We got we have Berkshires. They're also a heritage breed that uh, that we've found to be a great cross because they they do pretty well on pasture, but their uh, conformation is different from Tamworths. Uh, Tamworths are kind of short and squat and uh, um, sh uh, short backed, and uh, their loins are a little bit smaller. 
the Berkshires have very, very long backs. They have great loins, and uh, they also have um, um, long bellies for for making a lot of bacon. And and so we like the conformation of the Berkshires. And so we're a, we're a Tamworth Berkshire cross or Tamburks as as we call them up this way, and we've had great luck with them, um, especially. You know, if we have purebred Tamworth sows and we have a purebred Berkshire uh, boar, we end up with uh, some very vigorous hybrids that that uh, that do extremely well. They grow fast. That do very well out on pasture, and um, we really have had great luck with them. So I have a section here about farrowing on pasture, and I thought I'd share that with you. I want to encourage people to farrow on pasture. Um, I think it's a far less stressful environment for the sow and her piglets. Uh, I think she really appreciates, or they really appreciate the ability to to move freely and to build their own nests and to to um, uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, set their own environment, their own farrowing environment. And so whenever possible, we do that. We have some pretty severe weather up here, and so in the deep of winter, sometimes we'll farrow indoors. Even in that situation, we try to give them plenty of room to move around in deep bedding. Um, uh, but we've never, never quite nearly as good as being outside. Uh, <clears throat> so farrowing on pasture, except in the worst of weather, um, is a, is is one of our rules here. Um, along about when you see this <coughs> the sow uh, when her teeth start to bag up and and um, that means that within several days she's about to drop and and she'll uh, we we separate that sow out from her mates and and uh, we'll give her plenty of material and a sh and and a shelter to make a nest in. Um, <coughs> Once the sow starts to drop, uh, really she should she she should uh, continue to drop uh, fairly steadily until you you see the placenta ejected. Um, the the one rule that I have here is that you know you can really do so much more damage by uh, getting involved um, Unless there's a real extreme case, you really want to stay out of the sow's way and allow her to do her thing. Um, Any time that you you do get involved, that you feel you have to get in there and move a piglet out of the way or do something, uh, it can often end up in more injury to other piglets that wouldn't have happened otherwise if you get that sow upset. So we tend to... Um, let them do their thing. 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to be just fine and um, and and do their business without any trouble. Um, there are times when, obviously, when things go wrong, and um, if you don't have experience with that, then you need to call your vet and you need to make sure that you have a good vet on call that you can get get up to you. Um, any time that you see no activity from from a sow that's been uh, that's been farrowing for uh, for some time, and you don't see any activity for over an hour, and it's starting to get on to two hours, and you haven't seen a placenta, and you haven't seen anything come on out, maybe a few piglets, and then it stops. That's cause that's probably cause for intervention, and you want to get your vet out to you. Um, Unfortunately, when things do go wrong for sows, uh, they 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 usually go uh, very wrong. And uh, even though it doesn't happen very often, it's it's worth being prepared for that if if um, if it does happen. The nice thing about it is that the the more you farrow outside, the less likely they are to have issues. So um, so so get them out there. Uh, After the birth, after they've settled out and had their placenta, again, you you really want to give the, give at least two to three days for that sow to just get used to to being in with her piglets. Um, 
anything you do that uh, that upsets that mom could cause inadvertent crushing or stepping on the piglets. Um, you know, if you're picking up a piglet or if you're, uh, you know, <clears throat> trying to move one out of the way because you think it's in danger or something like that, that can often cause more crushing that wouldn't have happened. Um, one of the facts of life uh, for, for uh, farrowing in any situation that doesn't involve a farrowing crate like they have in our large commercial uh, pork operations is um, is that there will be some crushing. If you farrow pigs in a natural situation, you will experience some crushing. Generally, it's a smaller piglets and, and it and it happens, it's a natural part of the process. Um, and uh we tend to let nature take its course in that respect and um uh and we 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 still average above the the commercial average of eight piglets per, per sow. Questions, comments about that? So after a few days, once the uh, once the piglets are uh, have been born, and if you have uh, multiple sows going within you know within a week or so of each other, you can certainly combine litters and, and sows um, into a nursery situation, which is actually I think a, a better, more natural situation uh, for the pigs, and it's great out on pasture. Uh, socialization of the piglets, the moms feel um, less isolated, and it's just a better, a better situation all around, and, and less work for you. So, uh, so, so we we put nursery paddocks together, and um, and then we we allow uh, piglets to to suckle for eight weeks before we for, before we wean them off. We feel like that gives them the best start. And it also gives the moms a, a break uh, from breeding for at least two cycles before they get bred back in. So we're uh, <coughs> we're um, we know that that's quite a lot of time um, from a kind of a factory farm perspective, but uh, we feel like it's it's the it's the best possible world for those pigs and those sows. So any questions about about uh, about farrowing on pasture. One of the things that's really nice about farrowing on pasture is to have one of those pig nets. Um, very easy, kind of in situ to uh, to 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 corral up a sow um, who's getting ready to farrow and kind of separate her out within a paddock and keep the other pigs away from her. And put a you know put a shelter in there with lots of bedding, bedding that gives her a great space um, without having to push her or, or move her anywhere in particular. You can just kind of get her get her over to the side and connect your net up, and and there you have it, an instant paddock within a paddock, and she's ready to ready to go. So earlier I mentioned uh, some other issues, parasites and things like that. Um, Bruce, I just want to give a time check. Um, we are at about quarter after eight, so if um, I don't know where you are in your presentation, but if you could plan on wrapping up here in maybe five or ten minutes, and then we could do some questions and um, hopefully be done by eight thirty. No problem. All right. Uh, I'm on my last uh, last two slides. So. Okay. All right. Parasites. Um, a couple of things you should know about parasites. If you are hoping not to use worming as a regular part of your management for these pigs, uh, you need to keep um, you need to move your pigs in such a way that you're not coming back to previously uh, grazed or uh, uh, pastured areas. For three to four years, we we try to do at least three years, three seasons, until you come back to the to to a place that's already been um, impacted by pigs. This isn't necessarily true for those uh, grazing groups that we do behind our sheep that go very quickly, 
but it is true for places that we impact or, or that we're trying to renovate. And um, uh, parasites can uh, that that are specific to pigs can survive in the soil for up to four years. They're particularly uh, rampant in in, uh, in wet soils, and you just need to be very very careful. Um, uh, we found that if we that if we have that three year moratorium, that we can really uh, that we can really eliminate the use of of wormers. Um, on a regular basis. So uh, that's all I'll say about that since we're kind of short on time, but we have a lot more to think about there. The other thing that I wanted to um, to just mention as uh, uh, another consideration is um, any time that you're dealing with wet ground, okay, Despite their wallowing tendencies, pigs need dry ground to stay healthy. They need to they need to have a place that they can rest that is totally dry and without, um, you know, uh, uh, puddles or things like that. The wet paddocks are more likely to produce parasites. Um, so if you have wet paddocks, and if you, you know, or if you have a lot of rain, things like that, you can use bedding. Uh, sometimes that's more expensive, but it's worth it, I think. Um, uh, if you have to, you could bring your shelters out in those situations to try to uh, provide a dry area. Um, but without it, they're, they're going to do poorly, and, and you need to think about that. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that I really think, you know, uh, for us, pastured pork is our number one most profitable enterprise. And that may surprise some of you. At least at current feed costs and and from what we can get from uh, from other feed sources, um, that's the way it sits for us. Um, it's also a scalable endeavor, meaning that you know it take it would take us the you know about the same time to move two pigs as it does to move 50 pigs. Um, particularly if you've invested in FlexiNet which isn't a terribly big investment compared to what you can get out of a, a group of pigs. Um, and for, from our perspective, there are many, many, many ways compared to other meats in terms of adding value to pork. So uh, we're known for our seven different sausage varieties. Uh, we do a summer sausage, which is a no nitrate. Um, <clears throat> Uh, pork and beef product that uh, that people don't have to refrigerate until they open. Um, and since pigs eat everything, you can easily di differentiate your product from, from other farmers by just feeding something unique. I mean, there are a lot of people who take advantage of the idea that their, their pork is whey fed or that their pork is apple fed or that uh, they're, you know, they're acorn fed from the oaks that are in their forested uh, paddocks. And these are the things that I think um, can make for a unique uh, farm venture that, uh, that pays you back. And I'll end with that. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. This, uh, I've learned so much um, myself here. Uh, and I'm just um, going through, I'm going to catch some of the questions that we missed. And if you have any lingering questions, go ahead and type them in now. Um, we'll see how many we can get to here in the next 10 minutes. Bruce, I also wanted to ask you um, if you uh, would feel comfortable with me sending out a PDF of your presentation to the people who are with us this evening. Um, I'm sure that we'll figure out uh, when we have a little more time how to get that in my hands, and then they would be able to see all the pictures and things like that that you put together for this presentation. I think everyone would appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, all right. So uh, if you haven't already, folks, do type your email address into the chat box. Um, I'll be able to copy it from there, and I'll send you a PDF of the presentation. Um, that we unfortunately were not able to get into our system. If you want that to be private, just under where you type, say send to moderators, and then I'll only be able to see that. Um, so let's get to some of these questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Um, there were uh, several questions about the huts and wanting some more um, information on, um, on the huts. How big the huts are that you're speaking of, and how many pigs 
um, they actually hold. And if that's different in the winter, if you need to provide more space or um, something like that. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to find the actual question on here. Um, so, so specifically for farrowing huts, it just needs. It actually, if you look at a at a good space for farrowing, it needs to be kind of twice the size of the sow that's that will be using it. Does it is that answering the question? Yep. And they were also asking about the the huts that you put out there for um, shelter from. Uh, oh yes. In the winter, and for shade in the summer. So, so the, um, we have done. We've done two things. One, we bought a commercially available hut called Porter Hut. Uh, you can look it up online. Um, for those of you that are from the Northeast, uh, there's a. I think there's a dealer over in New Hampshire. Um, they do cost a bit and uh uh you know so if so so, so they they work out perfectly actually they make a a farrowing size hut and then they make a much larger group hut um i think our group hut is oh 12 12 feet by 20 feet and i can walk into it um as long as there isn't a whole lot of bedding on the floor so it's probably 6 feet tall or so and um, it runs on four by four runners that have loops that you can loop a chain through. And our little uh, RTV, which is a, maybe an 18 horsepower um, utility vehicle, can pull that uh, across the ground as long as there aren't big rocks or things like that. Um, so, so these are it's on skids. The uh, the the smaller porter huts that uh, that we use for farrowing shelters, uh, one person can pick those up. It's better with two, um, but you can move those by hand. You can put them on a little trailer or cart and, and move them that way as well. Um, so 12 by 20 works out great for a market set of pigs, that 25 to 40. Um, uh, uh, you know, 100 pounders can fit in there with no problem, and uh, they, they, um, you know, the great thing about pigs is that they will not soil their bed. Uh, they are very smart about that, and you know, they'll, they, they will uh, drop their manure well away from where they're sleeping and and where they're eating. So. Um, so you can put a bunch of bedding in there, and generally all they're using it for is to crawl in right next to each other in a big pig pile underneath the hay, or whatever other straw or whatever other bedding you have in there, and uh, you, they they pack right in there, and that's what they want to do, and that's what they need to do to keep warm. So um, so that's a great size. Yeah. Yeah. We have also done uh, uh, homemade structures. Hoop structures that are very much like, uh, well, they're uh, they're almost exactly the same design, except we've used uh, we've used PVC pipe over a wooden frame, and um, and then used wire pig panels to kind of protect the, the PVC and plastic over the top of that. Obviously, don't those don't last as long <laughs> as the metal structures. Yeah. Um, the other question that came up was predation and whether you have um, issues uh, with wild dogs or coyotes and and uh, anything you do to um, deal with that. So uh, we have never to our knowledge had um, had predation loss uh, in our pigs. Now we've lost lots of chickens. We we've <clears throat> maybe even lost a lamb or two, though I haven't lost a lamb probably in eight years um, with FlexiNet. So we found that FlexiNet, uh, um, or even a low uh, poly wire that's very hot will, <clears throat> will, 
will will stop those predators in their tracks. And of course, a sow is a is an extremely scary animal when um, when one of its young is 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 uh, in trouble. So um, no, we've never lost any we've never lost any pigs to to um, to predation. Um, I'm not saying that you can't, but I think a good strong flexion net with a hard charge on it will stop just about anything, with the exception of a fox. I mean, there's no way a fox is going to get after a, a, a piglet with a sour rump. All right. Um, so let's see. Um, another question came up is uh, specific. Um, Grasses or pasture mix, mixes that you use um, in your uh, in your pasture, and also um, what grazers follow your pigs during the three years um, that you keep them off the pasture. Right. So um, when we're renovating, uh, we're putting in a, a mix of mostly perennial uh, ryegrass. And which would be about 70%. There's other grasses in there as well, but it's mostly perennial ryegrass, and then a 30% legume mix on top of that. And our our ideal pasture for our beef and lamb products is 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 that ratio. Um, and so the pigs are stuck with that, unfortunately, because our primary grazers and the you know our 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 biggest animal groups are are ruminants. Um, and you know, to be honest, that's one of the reasons why we want to give our our pigs access to forest as well, um, so that they do have more diversity in the forest. And and uh, uh, what do the foresters call it? Mast, I guess, or you know, other foods that come out of the forest. We do have a lot of wild apple trees. We have a lot of beech beech nuts. Um, uh, that that pigs take advantage of when when they have access to the forest. So that you know, I guess uh, you know we're 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 going for high end grazing uh, because we're finishing our ruminants on grass, and that's what we're seeding down with. All right. Um, and then there was another question about whether you run um, same sex. Uh, pigs together, um, whether you, let me see if I can find the question exactly. I think uh, I read that question. I, I think I can yeah. answer that. We do not run uh, single sex groups. Um, uh, we we castrate uh, all of our males uh, bef by the time they're a week old. We castrate them. Once, they, once they're established and, and running around and uh, the mom um, uh, it, it's kind of settled. We uh, we get all the males and we we castrate them in that first week, and and that's uh, that's a difficult thing to do for some folks. You could have your vet do it. Um, we do all our own castrating. Uh, at that age, the nervous system is uh, you know hasn't developed to the point where it's um, where it's extremely painful for them, it certainly is painful. We know that, but we uh, we castrate so we don't have to worry about it. One of the things that people will tell you about is uh, a, a thing called boar taint. If you allow your your male uh, pigs to stay as boars, even if you're not going to use them as breeders, um, you you run the risk of of not having a meat that will be uh, Will be saleable at the end if you're interested in selling it, or eatable for most people. Um, we have we've cut a number of boars where that hasn't been the case, but but we've also experienced the other end of the stick. So we do we castrate all of our boar piglets uh, except for any one that we want to keep for breeding purposes, and uh, it's actually a very simple process. It's easy to do when they're small. And the amazing thing about it is you make one little incision and uh, in less than, it seems like almost instantly, but probably in less than three days, you can't even tell that there was ever a, a cut there. Um, and you make sure the testicles come out and, and you're guaranteed of not having a, 
uh, any bore taint and you don't have to worry about breeding on the on, on the piglet side. All right. Well, Bruce, I think we're going to wrap it up this evening. Um, I know there are still some lingering questions, and in that follow-up email, I'll send out some resources which may help answer some of um, the questions that you uh, have there, and I'll maybe pick Bruce's brain a little bit more um, if, if I'm having a hard time coming up with stuff. Um, but thank you very much for joining us this evening and taking time out of your schedule. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, for all of you out there, um, we are going to have a new Farmer Project webinar um, on the last Tuesday um, of every month um, in the evening. So uh, next one actually is a little bit different because of the holidays. It's going to be on December 20th. It's going to be on raising broilers, uh, broiler chickens. Um, so uh, join us for that. And um, again, thanks so much, Bruce. Have a great evening. You bet. Thank you.